Good morning, everyone. And thank you. Thank you for joining us today. It is a privilege to stand before you as we celebrate the second annual Juneteenth celebration for the School of Medicine Basic Sciences in partnership with the Black Cultural Center and its director, Dr. Roosevelt Noble, Assistant Dean of Residential Colleges. Juneteenth is not merely a celebration of the past, it is a call to action for the present and the future. Let us be inspired by the resilience and determination of those who came before us. Let us honor their legacy by working towards a future where justice, equality, and freedom are not just ideals, but lived realities for all. And thank you audience, whether you have joined us in person or online, we appreciate your support. I am very impressed with the speakers that will join us today and the activities that will take place here and at the Surratt Student Center. It will be a treat for us all. Happy Juneteenth. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. John Kirian, Dean of the School of Medicine, Basic Sciences to the stage to share his opening remarks. Thank you, Felicia, for that introduction and for inviting me here. It's an honor with, uh, for me to be with you all this morning to help kick off the 2023 Juneteenth celebrations. As many of you may know, President Biden made Juneteenth a federal holiday in 2021. And just this past May, Tennessee's Governor Lee signed a bill into law recognizing Juneteenth as an official holiday, a paid holiday, I might add. As the president stated, Juneteenth is a day to reflect on both bondage and freedom, a day of both pain and purpose. It is an equal measure, a remembrance of both the long, hard night of slavery and subjugation, as well as a celebration of the promise of a brighter morning to come. On Juneteenth, we remember our extraordinary capacity to heal, to hope, and to emerge from our worst moments as a stronger, freer, and more just nation. It is also a day to celebrate the power and resilience of Black Americans who have endured generations of oppression and the ongoing journey towards equal justice, equal dignity, equal rights, and equal opportunity in America. Juneteenth is an important day for commemorating freedom in America and a reminder that the freedoms we enjoy today aren't free. They were clearly paid for by those in the past with blood, sweat, tears, and yes, with their lives. The legacy of Juneteenth reminds us to never give up hope in uncertain times. Juneteenth is a day of remembrance, education, and celebration. I'm sure you will enjoy the lectures and festivities planned for today. And now I'll turn the proceedings back over to Felicia. Thank you, Dr. Carrion. And now please come to the stage, Dr. LaRosa Williams, um, he is a professor at Tennessee State University, so he's one of our own in the city. I'm so glad to have you here to let us know, um, to share some information with us about Juneteenth. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, the Vanderbilt School of Basic Sciences for the invitation to speak at this year's June celebration. Um, you know, there are a lot of options you had, but you selected me and I am grateful and honored for the invitation. I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Jenkins for her patience and willingness to reach out to me and allowing me to put a face with this um, DEI office here at Vanderbilt. I'm grateful for your patience, especially this morning, because I always get lost when I come here. Um, but I'm delighted to have made another friend on this campus and at this university. I want to talk a bit today about Juneteenth and share my thoughts about what it means to me as a scholar of African American history and a descendant of Africans who were brought to America in chains. The title of this talk is taken from 
a sermon given by a man named Jonathan Gibbs. Um, bear with me one moment, please. Some reason I can't get this to advance. So maybe um, okay. um, Jonathan Gibbs was a Jonathan Gibbs was um, an abolitionist. He was a Presbyterian minister. Um, he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Um, he also came to Florida during Reconstruction and became superintendent of public instruction as well as Secretary of State. And I think um, his most remarkable role was that of a minister in Philadelphia. On January 1st, 1863, he gave a sermon entitled, he gave a speech entitled, Freedom's Joyful Day. And I want to read an excerpt of it to you. He says, today, standing on the broad platform of the common brotherhood of men, we solemnly appeal to the God of justice, our common father, to aid us to meet manfully the new duties and the new obligations that this memorable day will surely impose. The proclamation has gone forth and God is saying to this nation by its legitimate constitute head, man must be free. Gibbs gave this speech on the same day that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And as I think about what this moment meant for him, um, you know, he probably didn't get a whole lot of sleep the night before. New Year's Eve, you had something called watch night service that occurred throughout the North and the South. And this was a, 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 a service that in, involved a lot of singing, a lot of praying, and there were sermons, and it, it, the way it played out was they sang and they prayed until the midnight hour. And then once the clock stuck, struck 12, once the year of Jubilee arrived, there was an outpouring of joy. There was an outpouring of emotion. Now I, I referenced this because this, it's sort of the same feeling that I would imagine the folks down in Galveston felt once um, General Granger shows up and he makes the announcement that they are free. Watch night service is something that still occurs today. I, growing up, my father used to make us go to watch night service. And it was all right until I got older and wanted to go out. And my father would say, well, you could go where you want to go after midnight. And um, as I got older, I didn't care too much for it. But after I became a scholar and I started looking at this moment, um, when I began to look at the sources and, and read the sermons that were preached and listen to the songs that were sung and even catch some of the prayers that were prayed, that were submitted at this time. And I thought it was like, wow, 
these are very similar to what we sing and pray in this little bitty church back in Tallahassee, Florida. And then it dawned on me that those hours that we spent going up to the midnight hour were minutes, were hours that we were probably the closest with what our ancestors felt all year. So when we start thinking about Juneteenth, be very mindful of the connections that we have with the people who receive that good news on that day. But also be aware that there was a response to the Emancipation Proclamation. And this was issued by Jefferson Davis. Um, it's actually, this, this excerpt appears in the Richmond Inquirer five, um, well, four days after the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is Jefferson Davis. He says, on or after February 22nd, 1863, all free Negroes within the limits of the Southern Confederacy shall be placed on the slave status and be deemed chattel, they and their issue forever. And this is addressed to the people of the free states by the president of the Southern Confederacy. When we hear this, we see what a really profound moment the Emancipation Proclamation was because on the federal side, on the union side, they are now linking emancipation with union victory. Conversely, when we see how the Southern states, the slave owning states responded, we see them in a situation where they harden their commitment to slavery. In other words, they're saying that not only the enslaved people that are in the South are gonna be slaves, but the free blacks that are living there, they're gonna be slaves as well. They're gonna be enslaved as well. Not only them, but their children. And the key word is the, in this is forever. So if we fast forward to June 19th, 1865, we find General Granger in Galveston, Texas. His arrival is roughly 878 days after the Emancipation Proclamation. And he issues this order, he issues General Order Number Three that says all slaves were free. And this, this, this order, the way that it's written, it's, it's straightforward, is directed to the people of Texas, and he leaves no doubt. He says, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and right of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and they will not be supported by idleness either there or elsewhere. It's an interesting comment there because he, on one hand, he's freeing them, but I got a feeling that his definition of freedom wasn't quite the same as those that he was supposedly liberating. As we consider this moment, I encourage you to put yourselves in the mind of the freed persons. Think about what you would want to accomplish as a freed person. Imagine one of the things I would wanna do knowing what I know about slavery is maybe reconnect with my family that had been sold away. Or perhaps I would want to work for myself and not for my former enslaver whom I probably hated. So the one thing to consider as we make our way through this Juneteenth is, you know, how do we define freedom? What did freedom mean for the formerly enslaved? And is it consistent with how we define freedom today? Well, the year of Jubilee had arrived for these folks in Galveston. 
the war had ended. And with this moment in Galveston, we see where, um, you know, on one hand, it's the last real account that we have of the military informing people that they are free. Um, but another thing that you need to consider is that freedom did not arrive at the same time for everybody in this country. That is to say, freedom occurred in different spaces and different times and under different circumstances. Some, I think, um, that are most interesting, and, and, and they resonate with me because some of my people were at these places when freedom was announced. Um, David Hunter in 1862, in the aftermath of the Battle of Fort Pulaski, um, first he encourages African-Americans to fight in the Union Army. Then he unilaterally frees all of the enslaved people living in Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. For me, that's a big deal because that's where all of my ancestors were enslaved. So if I'm celebrating freedom, if I'm celebrating Jubilee, you know, I'm probably going to think 1862. But then here in Nashville, um, in 1862, Fort Negley, which is not too far away from where we are right now. Um, Fort Negley is constructed by conscripted black labor. And the thing that's most important about this conversation, I think, is that um, not so much the free black labor, although that is important, when African-Americans in the periphery learn that um, that the Union Army is in Nashville, that there's a fort there. They make their way to Nashville. They make their way to Fort Negley. So as you ride by there or as you go to the Adventure Science Center or whatever the case may be, um, you know, you look at that place as being a fort, but you should also look at it as being a place of liberty, a place where African-Americans first tasted freedom. Um, I remember a long time ago describing it as being, you know, sort of like an Ellis Island for African Americans in the Middle Tennessee. And we're mindful that the people that came there didn't come here empty handed. Their notions of liberty, their culture, their music resonates throughout the city today. So we can't say that Nashville would not be Nashville without these folks who sought freedom um, in the city at Fort Negley. But then you have the Emancipation Proclamation, which signed on January 1st, 1863. This um, is, was a long awaited moment for many African-Americans. And I want you to be mindful that Lincoln had to face extreme pressure to make this giant step. But in saying that this was the first moment, arguably that the United States made the statement that enslaving African-Americans was something that they did not want to do anymore. So there were 4 million people here in chains when Lincoln issues this proclamation. None of them were freed when he signed it because it applied to places where um, the union didn't have any authority. So when we think about that, that's how these African-Americans in Galveston could still be enslaved as late as June 19th. And also bear in mind that that particular moment didn't spell the ultimate demise of slavery. Slavery doesn't, slavery is still legal in this country until December 18th, 1865, when the 13th Amendment is, is ratified. So we have these multiple moments of freedom. How do we celebrate it? Initially, um, Juneteenth was called Jubilee Day. 
So every June in Texas up until about 1890, they would get together and celebrate this moment in the past. But bear in mind that um, throughout, throughout the South, you have these same sort of these same sort of, of celebrations occurring, but at different times of the year. January 1st which we celebrate today as New Year's Day, was Emancipation Day in many, many places in the South. There were simultaneous celebrations here in Nashville. One of the most notable occurred um, at Fisk University. And it says at Fisk University, the school and citizens of North Nashville celebrated the day in the Memorial Chapel where a special program was rendered. The largest celebration and one that attracted general interest was the one at Meharry Auditorium under the auspices of Walden University. The citizens of South Nashville and many from the city at large were present. So we see these multiple ceremonies occurring. And this would continue roughly till the nation goes to war in the 1940s. So they were everywhere in the South and then Shortly after the war began, they, they um, decreased in number. But as you see, these, these days were important. The 50th anniversary of the proclamation was celebrated in Nashville. And in this um, particular instance, they are meeting at Mount Olive Baptist Church. And that's the church that's right across the street from TSU. But if celebrated by the ringing of bells, the blowing of whistles, this announces to the world at midnight Tuesday that the old year was passing out and the new year was rushing in. The world rejoiced. 10 million Negroes had a double portion coming to them, for it meant that 50 years of freedom had been theirs, and the finger of time was pointing to a fuller freedom in the broader sense. So we have these multiple celebrations. What does that have to do with today? Well, we, um, we obviously are not in Galveston, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think it's fitting. I think it's good that for something as important in American as it is in American history, that's the destruction of slavery, that we get together collectively and, 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 and celebrate. Um, it is a day that we celebrate the demise of slavery as an institution, an institution that was central to this country's development, indeed central to this city's development. So I, I teach courses at TSU that deals with public memory, but I say this in all sincerity, I, I, I teach courses that deal with public amnesia. I look at what we forget and who makes the decision as to whether or not we are going to celebrate this thing as opposed to that thing and how we are going to do it. Um, I'm a historian and I'm not blessed with the gift of foresight. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with you know, looking at the past and making sense of it. But if, if you ask me about the future, then I'm gonna struggle a little bit. Um, 10 years ago, if you would have asked me if Juneteenth was gonna be a federal holiday, I would have looked at you sideways. If you told me that Governor Lee was gonna sign a bill here in Tennessee that made it a holiday, then, um, well, anyway, I wouldn't have believed you. But we, um, it's, it's important to note that African-Americans were cel celebrating Juneteenth before they had the endorsement of Democrats or Republicans or anything else. We were doing this because this was our time to celebrate what our ancestors had went through, to express some joy, and to talk about what we needed to do to improve. Um, but here in, in Nashville, we, um, 
and I'm, I'm critical of Nashville, even though I'm a kind of adopted son, but I, um, we, we're celebrating Juneteenth, but I, I'm not really convinced that we are really clear on how important slavery was to this city. Um, the slave trade was arguably Nashville's first big business. If you go to the public square, and you know, I like to go to the public square. They have concerts there from time to time. Um, I saw the Yin Yang Twins in public square a couple of years ago, and they put on a good show. Um, but for most of the antebellum period, um, they sold African Americans at the public square, at the courthouse, every Saturday around two o'clock. Um, there was a bank there where you could get a loan to buy people. And there was an insurance company right there on the corner where the witness walls are at that would offer you an insurance policy if you had your enslaved labor working in dangerous conditions. And right up Fourth Avenue, you know, you go from Fourth Avenue from, um, well, you go down MLK up to Fourth Avenue. That's where the slave brokers were located. We're doing a better job at identifying these spaces, but we need to take a closer look, I think, at how these people lived, how they endured their time in these spaces during the antebellum period. This slide here is a, um, a, a sketch of the courthouse as it would have sat during the antebellum period. So right out front there on Saturdays, um, families would be destroyed, people would be bought and sold. This is one of the arguably the founding fathers of Black Nashville. This is J.C. Napier. Um, J.C. Napier in a newspaper article discusses the location of slave markets here in town. And when I first started looking at this in, in, in my research, um, you know, I found some were located on Fourth Avenue where, where um, MLK intersects Fourth Avenue. You know, you could find them, but then he started naming out places that uh, I was shocked by. So most folks know where the Hard Rock Cafe is downtown. Okay, there was a spot there and then further up second. So what I'm saying to you is that slavery was everywhere. So the question becomes, how do we celebrate it? Um, there are no markers in this city that celebrate the dismantling of slavery. Um, we were doing a little bit better about discussing where these transactions in human flesh took place, but we, we don't um, have a whole lot of information or you don't have many monuments to emancipation. And I'm saying that and I'm struggling because in many ways we do. Um, any churches that you see that are in the city that date back to 1865, 1866, those churches in many ways serve as monuments to emancipation. So how does this relate to Juneteenth of what I want you all to understand today? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge what our ancestors went through in our celebration of Juneteenth. Um, this particular ad was found in a local newspaper, and I'll read it to you. It says, I will offer for sale on Saturday, the 7th of March, next at the Market House at Nashville. This is in the public square. On a credit of 10 months, a likely boy about seven years of age, a note payable in the Union Bank with good security will be required. Sale about 11 o'clock. This is an amazing ad for one where, because it demonstrates that you could purchase a human being on credit, 
But even more disturbing was the fact that, um, you know, it references a boy that's seven years of age and he's out there by himself. And I know that, you know, as a seven-year-old boy long, long, long time ago, my mother and my father always had conversations with me on how to negotiate certain environments. And I'm wondering what they told this child. I had to reach out to some social workers at Tennessee State to get some information about how, um, you know, what sort of behavior we could expect from this child going forward. And then there are other instances that become important when we think about Juneteenth in terms of what our ancestors went through. Um, this is from an enslaved man who traveled through Nashville who commented on his, 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 his journey. He says, one particular thing attracted my attention on the way to Tennessee. It was the sight of about 50 women working with picks, holes, and shovels, and a large white man cursing and driving them with a whip all had on hats. We were here sold and joined with another drove and awaited the horrors of another journey or to prepare in one hill for another. But while we were here delayed the slave, women brought forth several illegitimate children, which is common as white gentlemen had been cohabitating with them before and during the journey which is one of the greatest curses about slavery, as this narrative will show. And here in Nashville, I saw them bought and sold like cattle as an old Virginia. And this one, and, and this, we are currently in an effort to try and, we're trying to save the Morris building on, on MLK, but, um, before that building was constructed by McKissick and McKissick, there was a slave market there. And the guy who owned it, his name was Reese W. Porter. And he always had some interesting ads about what went wrong. He says, I have a large number of Negroes on hand that must be sold and among them some valuable families. And as I never separate families, I will give good bargains. Also several fancy girls. And I do expect the best cook in Tennessee. I mean what I say. So you look at that and he has fancy girls in bold, bold print. Fancy girls were young women of mixed ancestry who were sold essentially to be concubines. And as I, I think of that, and you know, we talk about conversations. Um, I know that mothers and aunts and grandmothers and so forth have conversations with their daughters about how to negotiate the world, right? Um, how, what is said to these girls to prepare them for the life that they are gonna lead? And lastly, this one says, ran away or stolen from the subscriber on the head of Manster's Creek, the 26th of June last, a bright mulatto girl named Sarah, about 15 years old, about the common size, and now pregnant with child. Any person who will deliver said girl to the subscriber or secure in any jail to get to that I, so that I get her shall receive $25 and for the thief, $50. And that's from Thomas Britton. So as we take in account these excerpts, these moments, as we learn about slavery in this city and in the country, and we focus on Juneteenth, because Juneteenth is going to be that day that we remember the destruction of the institution that had such a, 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 a devastating effect on our people. For one, I think the day should be a, a moment of reflection. Um, there's a song that they sometimes sing in my old church, in my church back home, how I got over. You know, my soul looks back and wonder how I got over. 
that's almost like the anthem, I think, for, for um, Juneteenth. And, and, and in terms of how we celebrate, you know, whatever gives you joy should be your form of celebration. So for all of you grillers out there, um, if you want to throw some meat on the grill, I'm cool with that. Um, if you are reformed and, and not eating meat anymore, I'm still, you know, that's that's all right too. Um, if you want to sing, if you want to dance, if you want to write a poem, if you just want to stand outside and shout, um, I encourage you to do this. Um, this was the first, this photo on the screen here was the first Juneteenth celebration that we had in the city. And it was an amazing day. Um, the DJ put on um, the cha-cha slide and we should have had the Guinness Book of World Records there because if you're familiar with St. Cloud Hill, that whole hill was full of people line dancing. But in the midst of this celebration, I would encourage you to take a moment to learn more about the past. So that when someone comes up to you and say, why are we celebrating Juneteenth? You can sit down and say, well, my ancestors were brought here in chains. When it came time to fight in the war, they were there. Some of my ancestors self-emancipated. Um, so we understand that freedom is not free, but never lose track of the fact that we were active participants in our own liberation. Juneteenth is significant because it's a day that we can come together as an American family and celebrate the end of what many people have said has been America's worst sin, its greatest sin. Thank you. Yeah, Q&A. <laughs> yes. New Year's Eve. Well, um, I guess I'm curious, over time, will that movie be lost, or is there a way to bring it back from the movie? A lot of... Oh, I'm sorry. She asked if um, she referenced the fact that she grew up going to watch night service and did not know the meaning, and she asked if um, if that was lost, if I'm hearing you. Um, a lot of times we do things because we do things, if that makes any sense. We do things because of our tradition. I never thought to ask why, but I knew that we were, you know, that's just what we did on New Year's Eve. My dad would always be like, well, um, you want to spend the night partying and y'all need to spend the night in the church. And it, in, in many ways, it, um, it was a missed opportunity because it didn't have the same appreciation for it as maybe as I had for Independence Day. Because, you know, there's never any doubt in terms of the meaning for that. And that's why it struck me like a boat out of the sky when I read this. I was like, okay, Gibbs, he's giving this speech after a watch night service. And I go and I look at the newspapers from Philadelphia and you know Bethel and all these other churches, they have a watch night services. And it's like, okay, this is a much bigger deal than I thought. Um, but to answer your question, I'm not They did it early on with the understanding of what 
it meant, but after a while, the meaning or the significance of it lost, um, came lost to time, I guess. Yes. And that's um, it's a curious thing at work here because the town square, the public square, was where many of our ancestors were bought and sold. And here in Tennessee, um, we have statues of Confederate soldiers in most of these squares. But that, that speaks to an earlier conversation, what I said at the start of our talk, who controls public memory? Who controls what's gonna go in the square? And as, as I stand here in, in, at Vanderbilt University, I do remember the battle over Confederate Hall a few years ago, um, a, a hall that was funded by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And Vanderbilt had to pay a lot of money to deal with that. So um, to, I, I guess to answer your question, um, it deals with public memory, who has the power to say that something is good, something is worthy of being remembered, and who has the power to say, we don't, we ain't gonna worry about that. And then there's the money issue too. Um, for something as simple as a historical marker, you gotta have money for that. Those are not free. And what it means is if you don't have the money, then you're not gonna have any history on any of these signs. Thank you for your question. There were a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. oh, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat, in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we make it more known about the real history of our workplace so that we can have to get a square market? Um, the process is not difficult. Um, oh, and, and her question was, how can we do a better job at, um, I guess, memorializing spaces that are important to us? For historical markers, the process is not hard. You simply have to put together a proposal, provide documentation to support what you're trying to argue. And then it goes before, in Nashville, it goes before a committee and they say yay or nay. Um, the straightforward process, but it can be tricky because I, when you deal with public history, you are dealing with politics, that's inescapable. I'm, I'm part of a group called We Remember Nashville. And what we are doing, we're working with the, um, Equal Justice Initiative, EJI, y'all are familiar with the lynching museum down in, well, the, um, what is its formal name? The Legacy uh, Museum down in Montgomery. So we're working with them to put up markers for um, lynchings that occurred here in Nashville. And we put up three so far. Um, two at the Woodland Street Bridge and um, one down in Cane Ridge where a 15-year-old boy was lynched. Um, 
that last one was very difficult. As we heard the usual things like, um, why do you want to celebrate a lynching? And the response is, we're not celebrating a lynching. We are marking the death of a boy who should not have been killed. Um, it was actually when we unveiled it, we actually had protesters there. And, and history, you know, once you move beyond treating it as propaganda, history can be kind of disturbing. And it should be disturbing because our, 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 the folks that preceded us were not perfect. They made mistakes. Those mistakes or those bad events should inform our understanding of the present and how we move forward. Um, most places, to get back to your question, most places are a bit reticent to be inclusive. If it's a history that's not putting us in the best light, um, we don't need to talk about it. And I kind of get that because, you know, if if a reporter were to interview me about my life story, they're going to get the highlights and none of this stuff I get in, did in college. They won't, they won't need to worry about that. But in many ways, our, our, our um, cities, our towns, our municipalities in our country um, are, are like that, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and I have, I'm pausing because I, I have a, a lot. Um, it's quiet as it's kept, and I'd be willing to bet a lot of this money that TSU is paying me, that some of those folks knew that they were going to be free before June 19th. Um, you know, they showed up there when when General Granger showed up, but I can imagine they had their own little watch night services before. Um, there are whispers. They look and they see that all of the Confederate soldiers, they're there, they're bailing out. It's like, okay, we, we that man gonna tell us something tomorrow. Um, although I don't have any evidence to to support that, I I I um I know how the grapevine worked in a lot of these communities. So that's one of my favorite facts. And then um, that celebration we had at Fort Negley that very first time when it was new and I um, actually got a chance to speak that day to the entire city of Nashville, you know, the folks that showed up. So there's a lot of people from Edge Hill and all over the city. And I stood up there thinking that, well, I will probably never speak to an audience this loud, this large again. So I spoke to them as family and came from a place of love. I don't even remember what I said. I just spoke from the heart that day. That's one of my favorite moments. Okay. Um, Let's see. I can jump. Well, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for speaking with us today. As I was sitting and listening, um, I expected to be in my head and be able to write down some facts, and um, but you placed me in my heart because what many of you know is that I have a eight-year-old son, and to imagine that he could, something like that could have happened to him, just I wasn't expecting that reaction. Um, so, you know, thank you for that, but also the, just the pride and the joy of knowing um, the, the situation that the people were in, my ancestors, and also that they were able to, you know, overcome that, and that this is our history as a country. So we have to take the good and the bad and use all of this as information for growth. 
So I'm very appreciative of you for coming to speak to us today. And I hope you stay around for a little while so we can chat and you can see some of the festivities that, we're, that are going on outside. And for those of you who are joining us in the audience, I hope that you stay around as well. Um, if you're online and unable to join us in person, we're gonna take a break and we'll be back at one o'clock for our second speaker, who is gonna be Dr. Raquel Morton. We're gonna have a fireside chat and she's gonna to talk to us about um, self-care and wellness in this day and age as we celebrate Juneteenth. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>